internal problems are all mental problems uh, because it's how we think about things. And how we think about things is what we then do, right? So environmental problems are mental problems. And I realized if I want to save nature, I have to work with people, people, people. You are listening to Climate Curious, a podcast for people who care about the world but find the current conversation about climate change confusing, boring, or scary. Hello, Ben. Oh, hey. Hi. So, so we how you doing? We, uh, we were off being curious last week. We're back. Right. We had a we had a massive break. A mass massive. Massive. Mass- a huge, gargantuan-sized break. Um, did you do anything curious this past week? I don't even. I don't know what that question means. What do you, What do you mean when you're asking me? Did I do anything curious? You mean anything climate curious? Maybe. In my or podcast just in, voice. In, just in general. <laughs> I'll tell you something that I did was was curious. I have this um, because we're stuck in. I'm stuck in London now for the holidays. Mm-hmm. I've decided to make sure I get to go to all the parks in central London. Because I've never done that that's before. That's a good move. And I went to Holland Park this past week. Where is Holland Park? In Holland Park. Not in Holland. No. <laughs> in Holland Park, the area. Yeah. So Holland Park, the park is in Holland Park, the yeah, area. Yeah, I mean, shocking. Okay. Yeah. Good. It's very rarely that accurately named, but Holland Park, the park is in Holland Park, the area. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's beautiful. No. And they have peacocks. Oh, I've heard about this park. I, that's the, that's isn't that an infamous park for having peacocks? I, I mean, and there's I, another one that's got flamingos or something. Yeah, I mean the flamingo one. Uh, yeah, there, there is one that has flamingos, which I have not yet seen. But oh, they have like so wild good. roaming peacocks. Oh, I'm gonna. Yeah, that's that's such a that was such a good way to be curious through a a break. Yeah, I'm gonna go and see some peacocks. Well, at I didn't the park. know. I didn't know. I thought I was just gonna go for like a nice walk in the winter in lockdown, and ended up in this beautiful little garden. So it was. It was. Do great. you live close to the park? No, no. Um, I have. I have rented a car for three months to get me Ooh, through lockdown. An electric car. An electric car. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Climate curious. Yeah, to, to link back to our, our second episode, an electric car for a car that I don't drive, so obviously for the people in my family who do. Um, right. And part of the job is to go and see all these different things. So actually, I was... Um, uh, the other thing I do is I go out to East London, to this bakery that I love, to pick up bread. Ooh. And the reason why that's relevant is because the last time I got to do that, yeah. Was right before lockdown, the first one started in March. Wow, when that was a I long was time ago. when I was visiting the offices of our guest this week. Oh, that was a nice segue. Did you see that? Oh, this, what a professional! Wow, yeah, that was like a, this is what podcasting sounds like, guys. <laughs> just in case you didn't know. <laughs> so I don't have a I don't have a smooth segue into this topic. Just to say that I'm a bit of a geek and I love the law, even though I'm not a lawyer. Okay, and I have loads of lawyers in my life um and i've always been so impressed with how the law can be used to bring about like social justice that's how i always knew it to be done Mm -hmm. you know and um so when i found out about the work of of our guest this week it was just mind-blowing for me i hadn't really heard of this kind of work being done before and Mm -hmm. i thought to myself like this is just very powerful to show how there are all these systems and institutions in society that we can actually utilize to to bring about like the kind of future we want even when we Mm. don't necessarily immediately see it and it was very cool to me that there are people out there who've been thinking about this for like a really long time and doing this work and basically Ben I was just very excited for you you to to hear about this work because I thought you'd find it pretty cool as well. Ooh, this is fun. This is going to be a fun one then. And so I think very much similar to Krista Mayer, who we had a few weeks back, who was talking about Mm -hmm. neuroscience and where the link was not maybe immediately relevant or obvious, let's say, to the the listener, people might not be sure how law might be relevant to this. And, and, And I definitely think they'll be surprised as how it's been used. So let me, let's get started. Let me introduce our guest and then then let's dive into it shall we okay go for it okay so james thornton is the founding ceo of an ngo called client earth um which he launched in 2007 so 
he's been doing this work for quite a long time. Um, and we're going to get into the details of what Client Earth does, but it uses like advocacy and litigation and research to address climate change, basically, and nature loss around the world. And I mean, James is a pretty cool guy. <laughs> um, and he's got a book out, which he co-authored with his husband, Martin Goodman, Ooh. and that's called, uh, I think it's called Client Earth, he'll tell me. It is called Client Earth, good. Um, mm -hmm. Which is about the story of, you know, Client Earth since it was founded. And I guess the other cool thing is to say that the New Statesman named him as one of the 10 people who would change the world. So, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. So we're in. Sorry, not that that is the, the validation for, for you as a person. Like, like years and years of being a lawyer, and then yeah. it's just this one, one list. I'm like, oh my gosh, the new statesman. Wow. Oh, so let's, um, <laughs> let's, let's, let's get into it, shall we, Ben? Yeah, let's jump okay. in. Hi, hi, James. Thanks for joining us. A pleasure. Great pleasure. James, that's so cool. <laughs> you're, you're one of the 10 people to change the world. That's that's amazing. Well, also all the all the work that you're doing sounds amazing. I feel like I want to, um, like the way that my my mind works is I have to like start from the very beginning and mm. then build the picture all the way up to really understand the thing. So, um, uh, what what is and I, I do know the answer, but I feel like maybe some people won't. And also, I don't really know the answer. So, what is an NGO? Oh, uh, so it's a, a charity, basically. So a okay. non-governmental non organization, you know, so uh, all the charities that are helping people, basically. Okay. And and so Client Earth is your NGO that you started. Yeah. And and you've written a book with by the same name that tells us the story. I feel it almost feels rude to ask someone to tell me the story when they've written a book. I feel like I should just go and buy the book and read it. But can you give me like a brief overview of what client earth is and how it came into existence where did it come from what was it what like how did you birth it yeah well uh first of all the name uh so uh i had done this kind of work in the us uh where i was using law to save the environment and people's health uh, and then i came to europe uh because uh the guy who became my husband couldn't stay on that side because human rights laws weren't uh, so good so we came here and then i looked around and i thought uh well uh, I'll just work with one of the big environmental groups like WWF or Greenpeace or something. And uh, I met the people who ran them and they basically weren't using lawyers. Uh, and that was amazing to me. So I, I thought, well, uh, let's see if we can set up an organization uh, of a charity where lawyers come together and work on behalf of people on the planet. And then the question is, what should we name it? So. Uh, you know, and I, I came up, I thought, well, I'm pretty good at naming things, you know, I, I've got a good PR kind of sense. So <laughs> I, I came up with a, a, a list of names. And then since everything's on the internet, I would put them in, you know, and they were all taken. And some of my favorite ones were taken by like, uh, you know, sewage companies in Florida, which have yeah. wonderful environmental <laughs> names, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, if it's, if somebody's got it, they've got it, right? So, yeah. so we were walking down the beach and uh, Martin uh, turned to me uh, and he said, you seem bummed out. And I said, yeah, I can't name this thing. That we're, uh, when I said, well, okay, so you're a lawyer. And I said, yeah. And he said, who's your client? And I said, that's really easy. My client is the earth and everybody who lives on her. And he said, that's the name, client earth. And I said, well, somebody's got that. Some sewage company in Moscow must have that one. So we went back to the motel and I looked it up and uh, it was the only thing I've ever Googled that came back zero. And I, I said, oh, this is fate. So we called it, we called it client earth. And it really does kind of suggest it, you know. That's like a gold mine of, of branding, isn't it? When you do something <laughs> yeah. and nothing comes up. Well, it suggests what we're, what we're trying to do, which is, uh, you know, you didn't know that you were our client. Uh, right. And, um, but here we are, we're trying to stop climate change and protect nature and, you know, protect uh, people's health, like reduce air pollution in London, where you're living. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're doing all those things. Uh, and they all add up to uh, one, you know, huge package of uh, trying to reduce pollution, reduce climate change, protect nature, protect people. So cool. When did you decide that you were going to become a lawyer? Is that the right thing to call you, a lawyer? Yeah, it sure is. Uh, um, and, uh, well, it was a long time ago, you know, and I didn't originally want to become a lawyer. I mean, I am actually not too keen on law itself, you know. Um, Miriam very kindly said she was <laughs> right. very interested in law or lawyers. I've never been particularly interested in either one, but I'm very interested in what you can do with it, you know. Uh, you know, that if you, because law is so powerful. So, um, 
I, I thought I was actually going to originally become a, uh, uh, perhaps a biologist or a philosopher, but I studied biology. Oh, wow. Uh, and then I thought uh, that once, once I studied biology, I realized that, uh, that nature was going to start going down like that, and I could spend my whole life studying things I loved and watching them disappear. Uh, and my father was a law professor. Oh, my gosh. So uh, lawyering was in the family. He was a law professor. And uh, environmental law didn't exist. I went to law school a long time ago. You know, I couldn't study environmental law at New York right. University. But I just I became a lawyer. And then I found uh, a way to, to use it. Um, and it turns out to be enormously powerful, uh, you know, because uh, there are these huge levers uh, in the law that you can move and, and get things done. Wow. So, so the climate stuff, not climate, but like biology yeah. um, was something that you'd studied already and was like a natural tie in to, yeah. so, cause I think what, like the point that we, that I'm getting to now in my mind in these conversations about climate change is a point where I'm starting to understand that like, regardless of who people are, everybody's got a role to play mm-hmm. and everybody's got something like something that's pretty unique that only they can do that combines like their interests and their passions and their desires or whatever it might be. Um, and so it sounds like law was like almost like a, a pathway for you to, to do the thing that you wanted to do. Yeah, well, it was, because what I wanted to do is to protect nature, you know, and, right. uh, and then uh, since law was in my family, uh, I knew it was a powerful thing. And I thought, well, I'll become a lawyer and see, see what's possible. And then, uh, then it became possible to, to use it uh, very, very powerfully. But what I wanted to do is to protect nature. And I didn't originally want to protect people because I was quite uh, pissed off at people because people were making all <laughs> their problems, right? Uh, right? And it took years and years and years. But one day when I was in a Zen retreat, uh, many years later, um, I felt uh, I had this very strong uh, experience where I realized that uh, uh, I, I had been I had been thinking that people were going to kill all life on Earth. You know that's what uh, why I was so angry, and I realized in this retreat that even if we did our worst, you know we're not going to take down all life on Earth. We could take ourselves down. We could take a lot of species down, but life would go on, mm-hmm. and that doesn't seem like a, a, a like an enormously powerful revelation when I put it that way. But it was for me, and I relaxed and I said, "Oh, wonderful! We can't kill all of life on Earth." And I started thinking, "So what do I? What's my what's my job then? What do I do?" And the answer was, um, mm-hmm. "If people are causing the problems, I need to work with people. Oh, and if people are causing the problems, it's because they don't know what they're doing." So I found myself suddenly getting uh, extremely fond of people. You know, uh, which was a big change. I'd been very angry. And then I started thinking, oh, okay, I need to take care of people and not just nature. Mm. And the next book did was, well, uh, you know, environmental problems are all mental problems uh, because it's Mm. how we think about things. And how we think about things is what we then do, right? So environmental problems are mental problems. And I realized if I want to save nature, I have to work with people, people, people. I feel like that's... um, uh a really intelligent way of phrase like that's such a like a branding masterclass environmental problems and mental problems but also um like there's a a theme like a recurring theme of like not actually wanting to to work with people i feel like that's like quite like a um social justice like worldview mindset do you know what i mean like people are like kind of secondary to solving mm-hmm. problems yeah it, it just means so much james that you went through this and you've, you you're mm. talking about it because i think one of the things i've struggled with so much in coming into this space and trying to understand the people that work in it and understanding why i've come to this so late i think it's because i was always really put off by this idea of blaming people this idea mm. that you know people are the problem and if we could just get rid of people everything would be fine and I never understood it because I always thought to myself well actually the world will be fine like the world will be here if we screw it all up we're just screwing it up for ourselves then the, the kind of planet will continue and I think it's so interesting that that you had this realization and and did it change your work when you had this moment yeah sure uh so well first of all it was, it was quite empowering because I could just stop being angry at everybody uh, and realized they were all my brothers and sisters, and I wanted to work with them, you know, and I wanted to help them figure out how to have better lives. And then I also wanted to protect them. So uh, so the, the very first big thing we did uh, in the UK after setting this up was to, uh, to bring an air pollution case, uh, because uh, people are really, really impacted by air pollution. I wanted to show that citizens could bring a case against government and win, but it had to be about something important. So I picked air pollution, because 40,000 people a year in the UK 
die early of air pollution. And uh, it's very much a social justice issue because everybody gets hit by air pollution. But the poorer you are, the more you're hit by it because you'll be living in a neighborhood where there's more air pollution. Right? It's as simple as that. So uh, if you want to uh, do something, if I had one case to bring, which is what I had at the beginning, that what, where I could demonstrate that citizens could actually sue the government and win, uh, they would do something really uh, big for people's health. But uh, we also begin to address this uh, social justice issue. Then it was air pollution, and, and we won. And then we won all over the uh, EU, and so we're, so we're working on that. Uh, but it, the other thing that it did change uh, for me was the idea of how do you bring people uh, into the, uh, at the center of your concerns. Uh, and it's, it is very easy to fall into the trap that you were mentioning, Miriam, as I did myself, of people are the problem, you know, got to get rid of them or got to move them aside or got to ignore them. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, it won't work that way. Uh, first of all, uh, no one will join you if you say, if you put up a flag saying, I hate all of you. <coughs> that not many people are going to join your party, you know, right. and you want a big party. This has got to be a big party. Uh, and um, uh, so that's, that's a really important aspect. And then I, we started looking for, and I did, uh, how, how can you work with communities, for example? So um, uh, all the work we do in Africa for, uh, we work in five countries there on forestry, you know, trying to protect forests. And, uh, and uh, it's been a big uh, learning for me because uh, the way you do that, so I hired a bunch of human rights lawyers uh, to join and who had experience working in Africa. And then, and the way you do it is by working with uh, communities that depend on the forests. So, um, so we started building networks of uh, uh, African NGOs uh, who were interested in uh, forests and interested in the communities that depended on them. And then uh, we started uh, connecting up uh, African lawyers and all sitting together, thinking, how can we, how can we deal with this? And the. Uh, again, it, it's a real teaching for me in that it's quite clear that you're not going to be able to save the world's forests in the Amazon, Africa, Southeast Asia without uh, empowering the people who actually live in the forests. Um, that's the best thing you can do to save forests. You've got to do a lot of other things too, but that's the, that's the most important thing. So it's a very good example of how uh, working with people and also people who have been marginalized um, is a way of taking care of, uh, of the planet. That's so cool. Do you, do you, can I ask you like a really, it's a bit of a tangential question, but a yeah. really genuine question. Do you ever feel scared? Like the, the, the idea, I think I've, so I've watched, I've been watching like a lot of like, um, there's a series called Mr. Robot, which is about like hackers and. Yeah, I know um, that one. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. and, and I've like, it put me in this really weird place of like yeah. conspiracy theories over the first lockdown. But I like the, the idea of like, um, fighting the government and winning to me feels like a really scary um concept like a, a really scary space to in, inhabit and to live in especially if that's like doing that over and over again mm. is your work does that ever get like does it ever feel like overwhelming or scary or like anything like that or is it just part of the course well no i i don't actually and um i don't feel scared um but i i'll give you a couple of interesting stories so uh one of the things we did, uh, so we're talking about climate change, you know, uh, uh, today. And uh, I, I always start with science. So if, you know, if the earth is your client, uh, then as a lawyer, you're supposed to talk to your client. So if Miriam is my client, I have to sit down with her and say, what's your issue? What's your problem? What's your feeling? Mm -hmm. um, but if the earth is your client, uh, how are you going to do that with the earth? And the answer I came up with is science. Uh, right. Because uh, the science can tell us, okay, what, uh, what does the earth need in terms of taking care of nature and taking care of, of climate? And right early on, uh, when we only had like four people, uh, I, I, scientists were saying, uh, if there's only one thing you could do to stop climate change, that you could do to stop climate change, personally, uh, would be to prevent all new coal-fired power stations from being built mm -hmm. in Europe. Because coal is enemy number one. You know? and, uh, and why don't you just stop all the new coal-fired power stations? And I said, okay, we've got like four people, but we can do that. He said, okay. <laughs> and I, yeah, we'll do that. You know? uh, we'll get going on that. So we, we got going on that. Uh, and one of the things uh, to do there was then to create an office in Poland, because mm. uh, uh, more than half of all the new ones were going to be built in that country. 
Um, and, um, you know, as I said, okay, so if we're going to do this, we have to find Polish colleagues and create a Polish institution. We did that. And uh, then we started by suing 14 huge investments in coal-fired power stations, these 14 vast, vast, vast things. And uh, the government was totally, totally, totally uh, hot on coal. At that point, they got like 90% of their electricity from burning coal. Oh, wow. uh, and this was a country uh, that was just like in love with it. You know, as it, it was like uh, maybe 100 years ago in the UK, right. uh, where everything depended on coal. But yeah. that's, that's where their mindset was still at. And when you talk to people in Poland, as I would go around and meet people to learn things, you know, have all these conversations. Uh, so many times I heard people say the phrase, coal, our national treasure. I, oh, I wow. just kept hearing that, right? Hundreds of times. And I thought, wow, this is a cultural situation. So anyway, we, we brought these cases. And then the, uh, the head of the office, so they, we hired these great Polish people to do this work and mm -hmm. uh, work with them. And the head of the Polish office started getting these, uh, these death threats. Because um, we had been uh, the treasurer, this, what would have been the ministry, minister of the treasury, uh, uh, had a press conference and he denounced us as being enemies of the state for opposing all these new coal-fired power stations. Mm. And then uh, I never got any threats, but the head of our office started getting these death threats where uh, he had two phones. And one was uh, a phone for everybody and one is, he had a separate phone that only his mother, his brother, and his wife had the number. I didn't have it. And the threats came on that phone in the form of it would ring and he would pick it up and he would hear AK-47s firing. Oh, um, my gosh. And that's pretty clear uh, Mr. Robot type threat, right? Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> but these Polish people are tough. So I asked him, so does that frighten you? Uh, you know, how are you coping with that? And he said, well, it frightens me a little bit. Uh, yeah, it kind of frightens me, but not a lot. And I said, really? And he said, no, <laughs> if they uh, if they really wanted to frighten me, uh, it wouldn't have been on the phone. They would have taken me out and broken my legs. Uh, then I would have been frightened. Uh, and I thought, my God, yeah. these are these are strong people. But so you do encounter some of that, but it's, it's surprisingly little, really. Uh, and it is partly where you work. Um, you know, if you were working in the Democratic Republic of Congo right. or in another country where the they really you can't protect anybody, then that would be tough. But uh, you know, working in the countries you do, even China, you know, uh, is it's all great. And in China, in particular, this is another one. Here we're working on the side of the government. It's very interesting because when a government wants to do the right thing, and in China they want right. to do the right thing about the climate and the environment for sure. On that issue, uh -huh. they are world leaders. Uh, then what happens is if you come along and you know what you're doing, uh, and you can bring world-class help to them to accomplish the ambition uh, then I've been surprised by how quickly things can go and we do that sometimes at the European Commission level at you know at the level of uh, countries and um, you know at uh, and China is a good example of that but also companies are now coming interestingly uh, and saying you know we see the handwriting on the wall in terms of climate change uh, you know what uh, what should we be doing and in particular, what should we be doing so you don't sue us? Uh, right. And that and that's a good question, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm always happy that's to tell you somebody. Want to <laughs> you want it to be that way, right? Because it's a lot yeah. easier if they say, "What do you want me to do so you don't sue me?" And then you say, "Well, yeah. you should do X, Y, and Z." Uh, and that's a lot more efficient than having to sue them. It seems, James, almost like you spent uh, the, the the first part in these kind of big David and Goliath battles, and and now actually because of those successes, the tables have turned a bit. Will you, will you tell us a little bit about those early successes? I mean, you mentioned Poland, like what happened yeah, there? Yeah, finish the story about Poland. What happened? Oh, oh gosh, yeah, right. So <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually a continuing story. Uh, but so we won those cases. So those uh, uh, and uh, a whole new generation of coal fire. And there were 26, I think, uh, uh, new other ones that were going to come behind that that they wanted to build. So we, we picked the, right. off the 14 that were, they were just uh, about to break ground for, you know, and these are huge things, you know, and huge investments. And uh, so and we won those and we started, we started winning them. Uh, and then by the time we won all of those, uh, the other ones have just kind of disappeared into the background. Uh, uh, so by w winning all of those initial cases, uh, again, you change the terms of the debate. and. Uh, you know, I was telling you how hostile the uh, climate in the country was to us. Uh, 
uh, and to this work. And uh, our Polish colleagues did a very skillful job. So uh, they, they found uh, a reporter who was a really trusted journalist uh, in the country and uh, hired him. Uh, and then he was able to spend his full time talking to all the other journalists, saying, I know these people, they're patriots. They're the ones that are interested in your children's future because they're trying to make a clean future with good energy. So they're actually really the people to watch. And after about three years of quite a lot of work in that regard, it changed the tone. So uh, when the Treasury Secretary denounced us, uh, the main newspaper for business also denounced us. You know, uh, my colleagues were in the uh, in the Supreme Court of Poland and you know, wearing their suits and ties. Uh, and uh, the newspaper said they were eco-terrorists. And I thought, oh, wow, wow eco-terrorists in suits and ties saying, Your Honor, I... I May you please consider this. It's a strange kind of eco-terrorism. But anyway, three, uh, three years later, after all of the discussions with all of these groups in Poland uh, and the help of this uh, good journalist on staff, the same paper that was denouncing us as eco-terrorists asked the head of the office, could you write an op-ed piece uh, showing us your thoughts on what the clean uh, and climate beneficial energy future for Poland is? Uh, and that was a huge cultural shift within three years. Now, you never win anything in three years. So m m <laughs> most recently in Poland, uh, two, two more things. Uh, one is uh, that the government decided it was going to build one more coal plant. And they were actually calling it the last new coal-fired power station in Europe, which I took as a real compliment, you know, because we'd killed all the other ones in the whole continent. And uh, uh, so we said, we're going to try a new technique. Nobody's done this in the world. Let's do this. Let's not use environmental law. Let's use business law, finance. You know, just straight mm. business law uh, to try and stop a coal-fired power station. So we got an economist study to show that it was a bad investment uh, to build mm. a coal plant because some of the really great news uh, for uh, you to be sharing with all of the people who listen uh, uh, again and again, so everyone really gets it, is that uh, renewable energy is now cheaper than fossil fuel to build. Mm. It's genuinely cheaper. And we can get into that more if you like. But anyway, so we got an economic study in Poland saying it was a, a, a bad investment to build a coal-fired power station when you could build renewables uh, for less money uh, and generate clean energy forever. Mm. Uh, and then when they, the company uh, didn't listen, we sued uh, as shareholders. <laughs> we spent 30 euros and bought shares. Uh, and we went to court and we sued the officers and directors of the company personally personally, wow. uh, and, uh, w w which is, uh, uh, again, nobody had ever done that before. And uh, our argument was, you are ruining our 30 euro investment by this bad, bad decision to build a coal fired oh. power station. And believe it or not, we won in court. We won in court. James, uh, you're literally just on a wind up, aren't you? <laughs> you're, you are? <laughs> that's, so, that's so good, mad. Isn't it? Yeah. It's so bad. And oh then the gosh. share price went up uh, for the company. So uh, the stock market actually loved what we did. They said, you're right. And the company was wrong. So the share price went up, which is a beautiful punchline. So that's, that's one really cool uh, gambit, you know. And then the other one is, now that we've succeeded in shutting, uh, keeping these things from being built, uh, right. we're working hard on shutting them down. So uh, that's the next stage. So you then need to shut down the existing ones. And the biggest of all, uh, the, the real, the, the gargantua uh, in, uh, in Europe is a place called Belchertau uh, Power Plant. And it's the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in Europe. Uh, and uh, to give you a sense of the scale, uh, it emits more greenhouse gases than one power plant than the entire country of New Zealand every year. So that's big. Oh my uh, gosh. That's big. And it produces about 20% of electricity for Poland. Uh, but it has to close, you know, uh, if we're going to save the climate and meet the Paris Agreement. So we sued. Mm -hmm. And uh, the judge, a couple of months ago, uh, made a decision in which she told the company to sit down with us and to negotiate a closing date for the company, uh, for the power plant. So the company was instructed by mm -hmm. the judge. And what she said was, look, uh, climate change is now not just an issue for these plaintiffs, it's not just an issue for citizens, but it's an issue for the company and it's an issue for the future of the company. 
So sit down and negotiate a closing date for a Belcher Tower power plant. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that I, I don't imagine happening five or 10 years ago. You know, the people's awareness of the need for this kind of action is so far beyond what it was uh, that it's, it's very encouraging. And I mean, that's just so incredible. And these battles that seem completely unwinnable and then using this, the tool, the law, which everyone has access to, but it, it uh, feels really creative the way that you're using yeah. it, James. It doesn't feel like, I guess, the way people might think the law is, which is, I guess, as you said, like in the suit and tie and very gray, but much, much more creative. Do you see this as a, a creative work? Absolutely. No, and uh, so, and, and I'm very comfortable with that. I mean, I'm also, uh, you know, in my, so the spectrum of my life includes being a violinist, uh, being a poet, um, and uh, being a Zen priest. So, uh, so this is all, it's all another uh, space of creativity for me, using law in this way. And then the question is, you know, how do you, uh, it's a, a, an unusual way to use law. But uh, so, it, but it's like playing an instrument. You need to be really good at the scales, you know, and you need to know what you're up to. Uh, uh, but then, then you say, okay, so how do I do this? And in this case, the scientists say, stop coal-fired power stations or close down existing ones. Uh, and then how do you do it? I mean, there's no law that says you can't build a coal-fired power station. In fact, the, the deck is stacked from the old days in favor of people who want to do that. You know, it used to be, uh, something that seemed like a good idea. So uh, the system is still set up that way. So you have to say, how then do I do that? And that's a really creative enterprise because you have to look around uh, the entire field of law and say, what types of law can I use? You know, And in this case, I was just telling you about where we stopped the last new coal-fired power station by buying shares and bringing a corporate case. Um, no one had ever used basic corporate law to uh, uh, and the the basic duty of officers and directors to make sure your investment is well, uh, but uh, and that that was a really creative act, you know. So so always we're looking at using law creatively. I mean, and another thing that you to be creative is uh, so you, you want to imagine what the law should look like. So if you look ahead, you know and. This type of work I think of as like playing uh, 60 chess games at once, you know, so you're you're looking ahead, you're scanning, you're planning, you know, and um, the um, so you want, want to also think what is what should the legal system look like if it's going to protect people. And then you work on changing the laws. And one of the really amazing things uh, for me has been working in China, because uh, I mentioned earlier, China really wants to clean up. They realize it's in their interest or enlightened self-interest, you know, to clean up. Uh, so they invited me in to help write a law so that citizens could sue companies that were polluting, uh, including those owned by the government. And China's is, a big deal, right, James? Like just for those yeah. who don't, who maybe don't know, because I think we all hear about China in so many different ways. But if we were yeah. zeroing in on on climate change, what does China mean in, in our fight? Like, yeah, just to give people that, that sense of it. Well, yeah, you're right. Um, well, without China coming along, we don't win the climate fight. Mm. It's really that simple, you know. Um, why, why is that? Because it's so big. China is the biggest emitter now uh, right. of greenhouse gases. So it used to be the U.S., which is now number two. It's now China. So um, and China was on this growth curve of getting bigger and bigger uh, with right. its emissions. So unless that uh, were to change, you know, we wouldn't get there. Uh, and the good news is that they really want it to change. Uh, and uh, so the president of China announced a few weeks back that uh, they were going to reduce their carbon emissions uh, before 2060 to what's called net zero, which means if you, if you look at everything they do, that they wouldn't be emitting any greenhouse gases on balance. Uh, and that's, uh, that's an amazing thing because they're going to have to really turn around their whole economy really fast. Um, but they're committed to doing it. Uh, and then one of the interesting thing was, uh, so then they say, how do we do that? Uh, and then this is very creative because then you have to think about how, how do you change a huge country's systems so that you, you can actually do the right thing. And you've been, if I understand correctly, you've actually been helping the government build a legal system and train 
judges and lawyers and people so they can almost in some cases sue the government right so they have those mechanisms in place that seems quite i mean that seems surprising well it it seems surprising to me and i got uh, invited in in 2014 to give a seminar to a group of supreme court judges in china and the number two person at the ministry of environment and the the head of the uh, environment committee in the congress so really top people uh, and I had just your reaction. You know, they said, well, they said, you're here because you're the only person who's done this kind of work in Europe and America, so you must understand how it works, and we want you to help us design the system so that uh, so the same thing can happen. And I said, yes, uh, hap happily, you know, and there are six things you need to put in place. But, you know, this is really a big change. This is revolutionary. And then there was a funny moment. The senior Supreme Court judge said, James, Revolutionary is a big word for us, you know, in China. Mm. Uh, and I thought that's that that's that was a beautiful cultural moment, you know. Uh, and, uh, uh, he said it's a big change, uh, but uh, so then uh, I worked on that. And the idea was they wanted, uh, they thought that they needed citizens, NGOs in China, to be able to sue polluting companies uh, in order to speed the cleanup. Um, and they even said, uh, look, uh, we're aware that uh, sometimes there's corruption out in the provinces. The further you get away from Beijing, the harder things are to control. And out in the provinces, things may be corrupt. And if citizens can bring cases uh, requiring companies to clean up, that will act as a check uh, on officials who aren't doing their work. I thought, this is beautiful. And then the, the same, uh, uh, then I, 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 we worked on that. And I went back three months later to check in Beijing on it. And then the, again, the Supreme Court judge uh, invited me uh, uh, to come back and train judges uh, to uh, to decide cases well, because they had just uh, created this amazing system of three thousand environment court judges, three thousand judges who were just deciding, dedicated to deciding environment cases. That doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Right. But they they wanted to speed things up, you know, and they wanted to do things in a big way. So he actually said to me, you know, what would you like to do next? Uh, because we liked your work uh, on the law that allows people to sue. Uh, and I said, well, the, these judges need training because this is all really new. And uh, he said, well, absolutely. And would you train them? Um, and I thought, me? Well, well, but you have to be entrepreneurial, right? So you have to say <laughs> yes. So I said yes. Um, and then, so uh, then we came back with uh, experts from around the world and uh, to train the judges and uh, me and others. And we started training judges. And then the prosecutors came to us and said, in that uh, law that you helped write, we, the prosecutors, as you know, got the right to sue the government for the first time uh, over the environment uh, when they don't do what they're supposed to do. We can sue on behalf of the people. So, you know, imagine that the, uh, the Ministry of Environment in Yunnan province is not cleaning up the water or the air. Uh, the prosecutors uh, then could sue. But they came to us and they said, you know, you sue governments all the time and beat them. You know, we haven't done this before. Uh, can you help us train to sue the Chinese government? Uh, and I thought, this is an amazing request from their federal prosecutors, right? Uh, this is like a new world we've entered here, a totally new world. So we said, of course. And by now we've trained like 1,500 judges and prosecutors. And the prosecutors, get this, have brought, have initiated more than 100,000 cases uh, since we've been training them. More than 100,000 cases. Um, and they're, uh, they're settling or winning uh, almost every single one of them. So changing the whole balance of how companies and people in China have to take care of the environment. So can you get away with ignoring the law anymore? No. Could you 10 years ago? Yes. So. Uh, again, a very rapid shift. And uh, since it is the biggest polluter in the world, this is a really key piece for how we're going to solve these problems. So this is this is literally, the new statesman is not over-exaggerating in any way when they say <laughs> that you're one of the 10 people who's changed in the world, right? This is like unbelievably huge. I'm finding it really hard to put into words like how inspiring this conversation or just listening to you talk is because like it actually in real time sounds like you like it's not often you hear people talk and they're actually changing the world do you know what i mean like that's that's on a crazy scale of like impact sitting down with presidents and like implement and 
just out of interest, how big is client earth now so i think you when you were talking about was it poland you were talking about and you said there was four of you who then were starting to recruit other staff in poland what's the, the scale or the scope of the organization now well yeah, yeah and i should be really clear i don't do this stuff myself i mean it's, right. a whole, it's always a team right you know this is yeah. team 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 uh, and the team has gotten bigger so um we're now i think last time i checked uh, almost 220 people a very, very uh, uh, diverse uh, group of lawyers from 26 countries and a total of wow. like 110 of them. And then offices in London, Brussels, Berlin, Warsaw. We're working in five African countries. Then we have an office in Beijing. Uh, and we're about to open an office in Singapore um, in the first quarter of next year. Uh, and that one is to take all this work on coal uh, all the way across Asia. And uh, like I was saying, we work you know, the, uh, inside Client Earth, it's always a team effort. Um, uh, but our team also always includes uh, other citizen groups. So, uh, mm. so when if we work in Bulgaria or any country, you know, if we work uh, when we're working in Ghana, you're always working with groups uh, of local people, uh, and you're sharing knowledge, you're sharing passion, uh, and uh, sharing everything you've got in order to work together on a problem. And that's what we're going to do uh, throughout all of Asia. So there are uh, something like 1,600 coal plants in Asia right now. There are another 450 that are planned. Uh, we can't let those be built. And we have to shut down the existing ones if we're going to do a good job with the climate. So that's the next big project. And that's how, uh, why I want to start this office in Singapore. And I now believe that it's possible to do, right? Because we've seen how well it works, you know? And yeah. and it's not just stopping coal. I mean, and, and this gets back to the social justice question because that's really the key issue for all of this. You know, the people in uh, Asia who don't have any electricity are something like 350 million people. Uh, and if you have no electricity, um, you're condemned to poverty, really. I mean, it's the worst kind of poverty. You're out of the right. system. So. Uh, the goal really is to not just stop coal, but the goal is to build a clean energy system. And we need to be always culturally sensitive and to you know, flow like water into the different cultures and do what's appropriate. You know? But that's mm. what's so exciting. You know, what, what do we got to learn by working in Indonesia or uh, all these other countries? You know, we're going to learn a lot and we're going to share a lot and build something together with people. Mm. And I, th I think uh, that's such an important point that you're that you're making as well in terms of, uh, as you said, like flowing like water into different cultures and, and working. I think it's like really important that the model that you've presented is one where you work with community groups wherever you're working. Mm -hmm. Like the one of the questions that was coming up for me earlier when you were talking about the work that you were doing in Africa was that how do you not just fall into the role of becoming a colonizer in that environment like yep. where you're just the hero and saying here's the way to do the thing but i think like that's a really uh important piece in terms of social justice of like working with people in those communities so that you're co-creating um ways of reimagining and reinventing ways of doing climate change and climate justice that's so amazing so no, you, you, you're totally right about that, you know, and so and in Africa, it was a huge learning experience for me. So the mm -hmm. um, and uh, the number one thing we said uh, to not go in as colonizers or mm -hmm. you know, post-colonial people uh, was to not talk to the government. So, right. um, you know, uh, instead we went in and we went around meeting uh, the local groups uh, and local lawyers and then found a good local lawyer to hire in each country. And mm -hmm. we found these brilliant lawyers who... African lawyers who became our our person who was in charge of everything, right. uh, and then um, uh, and then building these networks, and then then uh, and then we brought uh, uh, then we analyzed a lot of stuff and said we think uh, that the in order to make like a land tenure system work, so who owns the forests to make a system work, you need six rights, you know that's what we are thinking. Uh, and then we sat down with people and said, you know, what are you thinking? And, you know, if you agree with us, then let's, uh, that you need these six rights, then teach us how, is, how these rights exist or don't exist in your country, right. you know. Um, so that, uh, you know, mutual learning experience is then what produced some very beautiful results. And after about a, a year in a, a number of these countries, what happened is the government came to us and said, um, well, uh, hmm, so uh, you seem to be getting along very well <laughs> with these community groups. We, we don't. So, uh, 
you know, could you act as kind of a bridge between between wow. them and us? And we said, well, well, that would be that would be great. And then uh, working with the community groups, then we started proposing changes in the law, uh-huh. uh, which then got accepted. You know, and uh, uh, and uh, one of the ones in uh, in Gabon, for example, uh, was uh, we uh, working with all these groups. We created the first uh, law that really made it uh, clear that the community groups would get a uh, benefit, even when that. Uh, trees were cut legally they weren't getting any benefit a lot of the time so we created this law with them and the government so that uh, even when things are legally done uh, you have nothing before and now you actually uh, join in the benefits so you don't just lose the forest you know Um, but uh, but we saw the value of that and the need for that by working with these groups so uh, so it is very much that you know Um, it always has to be that way uh, who wants somebody parachuting in, you know? But that, you know, it's interesting, James, that you have this insight, which is something that has been developed more recently. You know, it, it's, I, I think, maybe a testament to being open to learning and the work you've done is that, you know, this isn't something you're just doing now, retrospectively, now that everyone's just, like, interested in not being colonial and doing diversity and all this kind of stuff. You, It feels like you have been having this mindset from the very beginning and that I think really shows in, in in the kind of work that you're doing and the way that you approach it, which is, as Ben said, really awe-inspiring and just so exciting to, to hear about. Um, I want to I wanna ask two last questions. So a lot of people we've spoken to have talked about the next 10 years as being this decisive decade, you know, and I'm really curious to know for you, if everything goes right, what does 2030 look like? What kind of world are we living in? Hmm. Oh, that's a great question. And I mean, I think in, if it all goes right, I mean, what we're living in is a world in which we've made a lot of decisions about where we're going. Uh, and we've decided to change a lot of things. We won't have completed all of those changes, but we will have uh, agreed as a community uh, of people uh, that we want our agriculture to be sustainable, for example, you know, and that we want uh, our electricity uh, all of our power to be renewable and you know our cars to not be fossil fuel uh, either uh, and uh, we will have made these uh, these big shifts uh, and we will have done it with uh, con- uh, the consciousness that it um, that doing these shifts are a way of delivering social justice um, because you can use all of this uh, uh, you're kind of re-engineering uh, a lot of what we do as a culture and if you do it consciously you can also increase social justice by these by these changes. So we, I think that's what I'm looking to see that we've uh, we've understood some of these big architectural shifts that we need to make uh, in the society, and we need to make them in such a way to deliver social justice, and that they we're on course uh, to doing them. The other question that we always ask um, is if people are listening to this podcast and they've heard you talk, and I, like I think that this this is super important to ground this podcast because this is like mind-blowing stuff that we're talking about um for the everyday person for the mariam or the ben that's listening Mm. um at home on the train on their way to work whatever they're doing what uh, they're hearing this and they're inspired by what you're saying what can that person do as an individual Mm. well at the beginning ben you were saying that everybody has uh an individual thing they can do Mm -hmm. and uh and i i deeply believe that everybody's activities uh, in this regard are equally important Mm -hmm. um Every individual's contribution is equally important. And uh, uh, so what can you do? Well, some examples. I mean, if you're a teacher, I mean, you can talk about these things and educate kids. Or if you're a parent. And if you're a kid, uh, you can hold your parents to account. You know, uh, how much fun is that, right? You, yeah. can, you can demand they do the right thing. And if you are a member of a pension fund, uh, you know, as many people are, you can then uh, write to your pension fund and demand that the investments of the pension fund are used to reduce climate change, not make climate right. change worse. You know, yeah. And that's a powerful one, when uh, the members of the pension fund write into the president and say, you've got you've to do this. You know, and if, you, uh, if you're an executive of a company, uh, you know, the thing to do is to say, okay, uh, the company needs to have now a, a, bi- a business plan that will reduce our carbon to zero by 2050 uh, mm-hmm. and to by 50% by 2030, just like countries are doing under the Paris Agreement. So if you uh, have anything to do with running a company, uh, you know, you need a Paris-compliant business plan. 
um, if you're a pension investor in tow, uh, tell them to invest in the right way. Mm. Uh, and if you're a kid, don't let your parents off the hook. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that was such a good answer. <laughs> James, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Thank you, James. And now it's time for our climate confessions. Let's fess up to the bad habits we just can't kick. Welcome to Climate Confessions. I know that you've all been missing your climate confessions for the week. So we have worked super, super hard on these. Um, I'm not going to make you go first, James, because I think it's fair for Ben to go first to give you an example of what we're looking for. (laughs) What? (laughs) It's fair. Okay, it's my turn to go first. It's your turn. It's your turn. So, and, and asterisk, if you don't know what climate confessions are, you can just go back to a previous previous episode Episode and listen hear us out um okay so my climate confession this week is linked to um recycling which i believe is linked to climate change (laughs) and i think i think that this is something that we will explore at some point but um what i found out like maybe two or three days ago is that using um the one use only face masks uh the ppe ones is apparently really bad for the environment and i didn't know that i didn't know that they can't that they're not like recyclable and stuff um so that's what i've been doing and it's really bad and and i've been doing it for months and months and i didn't realize so now i don't know how i didn't realize that either that's like my head's in the clouds but now i'm gonna buy a reusable face mask because that is better for the environment i'll buy you a nice reusable face mask. thank you for christmas yeah well, yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, do we even do Christmas here? I don't know if that's okay. It's fine. No, never mind. James, it's your turn. What is your what is your climate confession? What have you been doing that you shouldn't be doing? Well, um, I've been wanting to bring all the best climate change cases in the world, you know, and uh, that's that's my confession mm. really. And uh, you know, litigators are, are pretty um, uh, pretty competitive, uh, and I like bringing good climate change cases. So, uh, and some years ago. Uh, I, I said to my team, look, uh, so we've got to re- bring a good case against a pension fund because it's like a bank, you know, uh, the, this great bank robber, Willie Sutton in America, got out of Sing Sing prison and they said, well, Willie, why did you rob all those banks? And he said, what do you mean, why did I rob all those banks? It's where the money is. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, that was pretty clear. So uh, pension funds is, uh, is where the money is, right? So um, I said, let's, let's do a pension fund. Uh, that um, uh, that isn't doing the right thing, you know. And so we looked around, and uh, and we were beat by a uh, by a guy in Australia uh, who uh, brought a a good case against the pension fund because <laughs> it's not that easy to bring cases in the UK. Uh, and you know, I, my my climate confession is that uh, you know I was I was a little jealous that he he got there first. Now the good news is that it's a really good case, uh, and he did a really great job. So, uh, but I, I'm trying to I'm trying to loosen up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Too competitive. <laughs> I love this. I love Extreme this. Sport. I, every time each of our guests is so much more creative with their confession than Ben, ben and I are we're like oh, to use too much plastic <laughs> yeah. um, thank you Jane I like that I thought that was very personal actually like a real true confession that has to do with just your out- outlook I feel like now this one's not going to sound so 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 important and actually I'm going to totally cheat this week um, so I'm, I'm cheating because I was talking betrayal. to I know it's, it's going to be a betrayal so as you know, if you've listened to this podcast all the way through the end, we have like a great team that puts it together. And one of our, our team here on curation and research, Tara Cooper, you can listen for her name yeah. later. Tara's great. Um, we were talking about this episode and she said, I have the best climate confession. And <laughs> That's and, a mistake. Why did you admit it? Was it was a mistake, Tara, <laughs> because now I'm stealing it and, and crediting you. You're not stealing it really, just crediting you for it. Because... So Tara's, Tara's great. She's like a vegan and, and all this kind of stuff. And like, there's not that much, you know, there's not that much she has to confess about. But this one is so good. I couldn't, I couldn't like let it go. So basically when Tara is feeling, let's just say, I'm going to say lazy, sad, stressed, overwhelmed. She will, instead of, instead of making coffee in her house or walking down the street, like two minutes to get it she will order it on Deliveroo 
<gasps> oh, tar! Oh, no. <laughs> that's so bad. And, and, Even I wouldn't do and that. And I love it because it's so something I would do, but no, no oh, one ever admits no. this to me, and I always feel bad. So now I feel like I have a, I have a partner in 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 crime slash. I have not ordered coffee to the house yet, so in climate crime. Climate. You order coffee I mean, online. Potentially not an episode to admit climate cl- crime on. Yeah, well, given, litigation given, is an extreme sport, is what I've learned here, today. James, but that is that is our. Uh, oh, she has two coffee machines. This is it's excellent. The confessions <laughs> are just coming. I love it. Um, so that's so I, I I know that I owe you one, Ben, and the confession. But this was just too good to 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 give up. No, I'm happy um, with that. That's a that's a decent level of exposure. Um, I just want to end. I just want to say thank you. Just a huge thank you, James, for mm. for talking to us for the work that you do. I mean, I was just listening. I've been listening to us chat and thinking about the work you do and what I knew of it before. And what I realized, and I don't know, Ben, if you feel the same way, is you know we've been talking to all these people who work do this work out there and. Realizing that yes, we can be hopeful, but there's still so much to be done, and mm-hmm. what you don't always realize, or you, you don't know, is that there are people out there who are fighting on your behalf. Right. And and what has just so become evident to me during this recording is that you know, James, you and your team are out there. You really, we really are your client. You are out there fighting on our behalf, even when we don't know it, trying to bring right. about change to make our lives better at the end of the day, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I I just think, I kind of had this idea, because I'm a big geek, I was like, it's like the legal Avengers assembling <laughs> yeah. around the world. <laughs> but it is, it's, it's just amazing. And so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Yeah, thank you so much, man. You're amazing. The work yeah. that you're doing is amazing. And well, it's so you. important. Yeah. Wow. Th- thank you both. Uh, it's incredibly important uh, that uh, people like me get to share it. So, mm. uh, Mary and Ben uh, and Tara, the work you're doing is also equally important is to get the message out there so that people can hear what's going on and feel empowered themselves and feel positive about it. Uh, mm. And uh, that, that way we do it all together, huh? So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Until you. next time. What is, what's your line, Ben? Oh, stay curious. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week. If you enjoyed what you listened to today, please rate and subscribe and share the episode with a curious friend. Join the conversation on socials using the hashtag ClimateCuriousPod and let us know what you want to hear about next time. You can find us online at TEDx London. This podcast was made possible by TEDx London's headline partner, City. City is all about progress and supporting great ideas. And for the past five years, they've supported us to bring world-changing ideas to the TEDx London stage. Now they're taking it to the next level by supporting this new podcast. Thanks, City. This episode was produced by Josie Coulter. Curation and research by Tara Cooper. Engineered and mixed by Ben Beheshti. Artwork designed by Sabrina Russo and Rebecca Mingus. Music composed by Ben the Falcon Beheshti. Presented by Marion Pasha and Ben Hurst. Stay curious.